not going to attempt to name all of them off because I'll get in trouble, but we have uh, been honestly just incredibly blessed with amazing leadership at the local level representing our state in Little Rock. And we are so proud of the work that we have been able to accomplish over the last couple of months working in great partnership with members of our legislature to deliver what I think is not only the most historic education legislation here in the state, but what I think is going to be transformational for the students and the young people that are growing up in Arkansas. And for us to get to set the standard of what we expect and what we know our kids and our schools and our parents and our teachers not only are capable of, but frankly what they deserve. Making sure that our teachers are getting the reward and the incentives that they deserve for the hard work that they put into the classroom. We know that our students do better when they have great teachers. And Arkansas has some of the best teachers that you will find anywhere in the country. And they deserve to be rewarded for their hard work. So going from being 48th in the country to top five in teacher pay is something I'm extremely proud of. Empowering our parents so that they have all of the tools necessary to make sure that their child's needs are being met is something I'm unbelievably proud of and making sure that we have accountability across the board, whether it's our home school, our private school, our charter school, or our public schools, so that the needs of every student are being met and that every student in the state is getting the type of quality education that they deserve so that they can be put onto a lifetime of prosperity and not dependent on a government system. That's what we set out to do and with the members of the legislature, we were able to accomplish that. We know that we are changing lives for the better through this legislation. Does that mean it's perfect? Absolutely not. You'll never find a piece of legislation that is, but we know it is a vast improvement from where we started. We knew that we couldn't just continue to settle for the broken status quo and allow our students to go through what we knew was a broken system. We had to flip it on its head. We had to do things that were different. We had to transform the system if we wanted to put our kids on that pathway to prosperity. And I don't think there's a person in the room who wants anything different. And so that's why I'm so proud of this piece of legislation, not because it's a feather in our cap, but because it is a truly remarkable thing that will change the lives of kids in our state. And that's something I really believe, and I know that we're going to get to see the fruits of that labor. If I could, though, before I go too much further, get the legislators to actually stand up so that we can recognize them, because this would not be possible without their hard work, and there are a lot of them here. Don't be All shy. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I like how they all hesitated there for a minute. <laughs> Like all of a sudden, elected officials are getting shy. I know that not to be true, but uh, we are so thankful for them, for Senator Hester has been an amazing leader, um, and we are so grateful for his hard work. Uh, Tyler Dees and Delia Hawk have done an amazing job helping represent this area and really fighting for the needs uh, of the communities that they represent. And so we're thankful for their willingness to be here and help out today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Secretary Oliva to make a couple of remarks, and then we'll be happy to open it up and take questions. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you all for joining us as well. Thank you, Governor, and uh, for allowing me to be here at a, another town hall event. Thank you to the legislators who came out. I, I was telling the governor in the back, Senator Hester, if, if this whole Senate thing doesn't work out, we want you to go on the road with us as a hype man, because I was like, <laughs> this, this, this crowd is going to be pumped and ready. But we're excited to uh, travel around the state and talk about kind of this vision, this, the, the LEARNS blueprint and how we're putting it into action to transform teaching and learning here in the great state of Arkansas. I, I like to say it's a comprehensive approach that looks at everything from cradle to career. It's about getting systems aligned. We, we have a lot of talent in this state, and we want to make sure that the talent is getting the resources they need to be successful and that the system is, is aligned, starting all the way from early learning through our K-12 system, post-secondary, and beyond. Uh, interestingly, I like to look at a lot of data and, and a lot of statistics and, and figures, and U.S. Worlds and News Reports came out with a ranking about three or four weeks ago where they, they rank all the states in education, and it looks at everything from that, just 
from early learning through K-12 to post-secondary and ranks all the states one through 50. And I'm not saying it's the perfect formula or the best methodology, but it's an indicator. It's a, it's a metric, it's a piece of data. And so as I've been sharing um, some of this data and talking with leaders, and I ask groups like, where do you think Arkansas ranked? I often hear numbers like 45, 46, 42. And it's just, it's compelling to me to say that there's this kind of expectation that we should be in the bottom 40s on whatever metric comes out. And I, and I think that that kind of mindset or expectation we need to elevate and lift. And in fact, the ranking said that we were ranked 43 in the nation in overall education. And sometimes I even tell people that and they're like, wow, I'm surprised we're ranked so high. So I was like, okay, we got some work to do because there's some very talented students in this state that need to have opportunities to be put on an accelerated path. And if we're limiting those opportunities for students, we're never gonna see those state rankings and those metrics increase. So what we're doing with LEARNS is really about building a system that's aligned to support families, to support school districts, support superintendents, leaders, principals, teachers, with the resources they need and the structure that they need so that they can do just that, is push our students onto an accelerated path. So as I've been working with school districts, uh, we made a commitment once the bill was signed to go to every single region, talk to all, every single superintendent all throughout the state. And we did that, it stopped at 15 educational cooperatives. I, I've already driven, and, I, and, I, and a lot of you already know, I'm pretty new to the state of Arkansas, but I have personally driven myself over 7,000 miles on Arkansas roads since January. So I'm getting to know where all the cool little rest stops are. S Secretary Oliva is gonna become part of the infrastructure team next, cause yeah. he can uh, help with a specific list of roads that we yeah, know I'm, we need I'm to I'm making a list of every pothole on the highway first, so. <laughs> Let you know where we get started. Be sure to talk to your local legislators about that, not the governor, <laughs> if he could. But, but as we've gone through and we've met with superintendents and, and had honest conversations about what are we doing so that we can help support districts to improve student outcomes and learning, the, the conversations went really well and they were, and they were really um, informational. And, and a lot of times I think people had a lot of misinformation about what we're trying to do. And we, we can get in a room and have a good conversation about what is the vision and how we're gonna implement it. Um, overall, people leave excited and people who leave, actually maybe even feel relieved and, and um, they're, they're uh, grateful that we can spend our time and, and ready to roll up their sleeves and get to work. So as, as we've been talking to Governor Sanders about some of the feedback we've been getting on the ground, that's kind of where the spirit of having some town hall conversations came about to say, okay, well, if, if this works good with school district leaders and school uh, officials, let's do some work in the community. So thank you for allowing us to come here and engage in a conversation about what we think is, I personally think education is probably the most important uh, topic for the state. I, I'm sure you're juggling a lot of other initiatives, but I think if we can get education right, we fix a lot of other problems. Great, thank you so much, Secretary Leva. With that, I will turn it over uh, to you guys and we'll start with the questions. All right, all right, now they are ready. Okay, so let's not take it easy, Siloam, okay? We need to make sure that they hear about it, all right? I think we have one right over here. Representative Hawk, will you hand the mic to uh, our friend Heather Witt? I believe, I believe oh. Heather Witt's got a question to kick us off. Oh, thank you. Hi. Um, so many times with, I've, with school choice, um, with the voucher program, there are reasons behind that program that you want to give the parents empowerment, um, which is great. I'm a parent myself. Uh, one of the reasons that I've heard is those schools that are failing and to give the parents a choice to leave that potential school. And why I absolutely, as an educator, believe that we can always learn and be trained through, either through um, resources through the, edu uh, the educators or through administration. There are just some things that happens within the student's home that are outside the educators and the administrators control. So, um, and sometimes the voucher program may or may not fix those obstacles. So my question is, um, whether it be excessive truancy, personal conflict within the home, just the lack of focus on the school um, environment itself, or even homelessness that that child might be exposed to, have you considered or would you consider utilizing social workers within the school to help bridge those gaps and to kind of um, to help meet those needs so that a student when they come to school is a bit more equipped for success when those home needs are met um, for their future? 
I think that's, thank you for your question and certainly for being an educator. I think that's one of the tough places uh, that we find ourselves in on the daily basis. Certainly one of the difficult positions that so many of our teachers are in. If all that was being placed on them was to teach them uh, to read and write, their job would be a lot easier but it isn't. They're, each kid is coming, you know, you've got 25 kids in a classroom and each one of them is coming from a different set of circumstances. Uh, even in a neighborhood where it may all look the same, it's most certainly not. And so when they arrive at your doorstep, you're having to unpack a lot of different things to help those students and to meet those needs. Uh, what I think is the beauty of the voucher system is that because each of those students are different, some of them are going to have different needs. And a certain school may end up being a better fit for them. By and large though, uh, the majority, the vast majority of students the best school for them is going to be their local public school. And that's why this piece of legislation is such a huge investment, frankly, in public education. There's a lot of misinformation that says that that's not the case, but this is the largest investment that our state has made in public education in decades. And it's because that is most likely going to be the place where many of our kids are educated. So we want to elevate those schools. We want those teachers to be paid better so that they have a greater incentive to stay in the classroom because they are facing a lot of challenges. However, there are going to be some students where that school isn't meeting their needs. It's not fitting what that student may need. And it may be another public school. It may be a private school. It may be a charter school. And it may be homeschool. But giving parents the ability to make that decision to make sure that those students' needs are being met, I think is so critically important. How we look at equipping our teachers, maybe through social workers and other things. I think that's certainly something on the table that we need to look at how we provide more resources. I want Secretary Oliva to jump in. He's also been a classroom teacher. So he understands from a different perspective to some of the needs and ways that we can help add those resources. One thing I, I know is behavioral health specialists, more of those in school so that we can help identify needs that students have uh, at an earlier point until it's past uh, the breaking point they can intervene at a quicker moment and help those students and meet those needs much sooner than what we're able to right now and so looking at new ways we can do that I think those have to be part of the discussion and some of the things that will be worked out even through the rules process that we're currently going through so and thank you it's, it's an excellent question and uh, we, we know that a teacher or a school can't be everything to every single student, and that's why we're trying to provide opportunities for families to get their needs met. But the, the short answer to your question is, do with school social workers help? Absolutely. It, it's part of what, what I often say is kind of a system of care for the students. And I, I've been working in schools for over 25 years now, and if there's one thing that, that always, uh, I don't know if it surprises me, but it's always refreshing is how resilient students are. But that doesn't mean that it makes it easy. And a lot of times there are students that are facing traumas at home that could be disrupted. I would have a complete breakdown of what some of these students are facing every single morning. Yet they walk into class each and every day and you would never know the, the burden that some of these children carry um, within their houses. So we, we like to talk about how do we make sure we have access for high quality mental health education as well as access to mental health services. It's kind of two different highways that often intersect. And um, when you build out that system of care, part of what LEARNS does is it, it uh, requires us to build out some training in mental health education for training the, the adults that work in schools, not just the teacher, but how to recognize signs and symptoms in students that may be in distress, and then how to report them to somebody. And so that reporting to somebody, like that social worker or school counselor or school psychologist, is a big part of that, because we can recognize the trauma and distress in students' lives. But if there's no resources or no network of care to refer folks to, that's a real challenge. And, and uh, as I talk with school superintendents and, and district leaders, they, they share a lot of these concerns as well. Uh, they, they, they say they're dealing with discipline issues, maybe at higher levels than they've had before. They're, they're recognizing that there's a lot of um, trauma maybe happening in students' homes lives that they're trying to get the resources to support. But getting access to a licensed school social worker or school counselor is really hard too. So there, there's probably a 
ongoing strategy is how do we recruit more people into this field to support students and families, so. Thank you. We have a second question that was submitted online, and this is Kristen Hargett, and she's going to ask you about reading on level. I'm going to go ahead and read it. Um, with 35% of Arkansas students currently reading on grade level, would the emphasis on literacy between the RISE initiative several years ago and now LEARNS, what is the timetable you anticipate seeing the vast majority of students meeting that goal of on grade level reading proficiency? I think, thank you for your question. I think it's hard to put a specific timetable. Um, 10 years ago would have been uh, the preferred timetable is if we had intervened a lot sooner, but based off of where we are right now um, and a significant amount of data and research, one of the things we do know is that a child reading by that critical make or break moment in third grade is imperative for their long-term success. And so as much as we can make progress and move forward, that's why it's one of the biggest uh, pillars of the LEARNS legislation is literacy, because we know so much is based off of that foundation in a child being able to read. Um, and we know if you look at every statistic, um, some of the best thing we can do is that early intervention. And so that's why the LEARNS legislation focuses a lot on the early childhood, as well as these reading coaches that will help provide kind of a wraparound immersion service to students and districts to help bring them along, help catch them up where they're behind, and also help, I, I think, identify some of the markers that a lot of students will have that if we address earlier, they will be on a much greater path to success and have that you know, foundation by the time they hit third grade. It is a big, big piece of this legislation. I think it's probably one of the most critical and often one of the most ignored is the huge focus that we are placing on literacy. We've seen other states who have run similar programs, Mississippi being one of them, that was ranked right there at the bottom with Arkansas. Um, over the last few years, they have done a very similar program and they went from being 48th and 49th to over this past year, the latest scores have them at 22 in the country, doing a very, very similar program to what we have uh, put into the legislation through LEARNS. So will it happen overnight? Absolutely not. But making these important steps are absolutely critical, and I feel confident that we're going to see some changes very fast. But getting that majority, there are a lot of challenges we have to overcome, but I know it's doable, and I know our students and our teachers are capable of it, and I think that we can expect to see significant progress over the next year or two as LEARNS is implemented. And, and if I was to add to that, we, we talk about that third grade kind of benchmark where, where students, if they're at or above grade level in third grade, they're typically on a path to be successful in future grades. But what I also really like about what the LEARNS initiative does is it goes even beyond kindergarten and into the early learning space because we, we have that third grade benchmark that looks at students uh, reading at or above grade level, but there's also another benchmark that we need to establish as a state, which is what we would call kindergarten readiness. And measuring the number of students that come to kindergarten ready to learn. And, and early in Governor Sanders' tenure, she signed an executive order that tasked our agency with doing some research on identifying which parts of our state don't even have access to high quality early learning childcare or early learning programs. And the reality is there's, there's deserts and islands that we now need to roll up our sleeves and come up with strategies to try to make sure that every parent that wants to participate in a program can actually do that. And then right now, and this is what LEARNS fixes, is in that early learning space, there's probably about five or six different programs throughout the state um, in this en environment. And depending on where that funding comes from depends on which division and which agency oversees that program. And then that division and agency has their own definition of what kindergarten readiness is and what it looks like to help make sure that parents are getting the high quality programs they need. This puts it all under one agency so we can have one vision and build a program in early learning around the student and not the systems that got the dollars for that student, which is a big shift on making sure that we can invest at an earlier age to make sure we can get the number of students ready for kindergarten. 
And then from kind of a statewide um, progress monitoring, we want to monitor student progress. Right now, every district does something different in kindergarten, first and second. This allows us to do a statewide um, procurement to have one system so we can see all of our students and how they're uh, moving along the educational continuum that we would want them to do in kindergarten, first and second grade, not only just measuring their literacy progress, but also embed dyslexia screeners as well, because we know a lot of times struggling students have um, need additional layers of support if they have a substantial reading deficiency. So we're also adding access to literacy coaches. We're even empowering parents to participate in uh, tutoring. Uh, scholarships are available in this space. So we're really doubling down all the way from birth to third grade on everything we can do to make sure these foundations are being built, built a lot on what the RISE initiative stands for, but really expanding and, and really investing hard. I'm really glad you brought up the uh, executive order too, because I'm pretty sure that assessment is due at the end of June. So hopefully uh, uh... <laughs> you guys are almost wrapped up with that. So, and, and you know, that was one of the struggles that we had coming in is we didn't have a clear picture of even what was available across the state. And so that is helping us uh, make a determination of where the greatest needs are so that we can go out and meet those across the state. So uh, I'm glad that you brought that up and look forward to seeing that here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I think at this point, if we want to, we can open up and take a couple questions from around the room. If anybody has any, we'll be happy to uh, take those. If you just want to raise Governor, your hand. We have hand. one right here. Oh. And in fact, we have, uh, uh, I'm just learning, we have, we're in the presence of, of greatness because we all know 2020 COVID years in education was tough. We have the teacher of the year from 2020, Mr. Joel right here has got a question. Let's give him a hand. And thank you. Um, my question kind of just revolves around teacher retention and recruitment. And, um, you know, I think throughout this whole process and, and bringing on learns and like you said, maybe there's been some misinformation or things out there. Uh, I do think there's been some some words and phrases that have been used or associated sometimes that uh, have been harmful to educators or the feelings, um, you know, when we say that it's a failed system or uh, exactly what's going on in our public schools, uh, that sometimes public educators have been hurt by that. And so my, my question is, what is the message that inspires educators to to be a part of this there's no doubt every educator wants to see student improvement um, and see our students succeed i believe that a hundred percent but but how how do we and how can we as educators also support one another what is the message that we can share um, to make sure that hey the learns act is a support piece and is something that uh, you want to be a part of because of that student improvement Great. I'll go and then turn it over to the secretary. First, thank you uh, for being in the classroom and certainly for being a teacher of the year. Uh, I know it's a competitive field, so I've met a lot of uh, teachers as we've been traveling around the state over the last couple of years, both during the campaign and coming in. I think the message that I would give is that we believe in you. If we didn't, if we didn't believe in your ability to be successful, then we wouldn't be leaning in so aggressively on this initiative. If we didn't believe that our students were capable of meeting the expectations that we're setting out, we wouldn't be spending all of our time talking about it. We certainly wouldn't have put such a huge emphasis on making sure our teachers are actually being respected and rewarded for their hard work in the classroom. Uh, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but it is a huge deal for our state to go from where we were at the very bottom of the pack when it comes to teacher pay, starting pay, to the very top. That puts us on a playing field and a compet comp competitive with states like Texas and Florida and New York and California in terms of recruitment and retention. We also made sure, uh, and there's been a lot of talk about just that starting base pay, but we also made sure every single teacher in the state received a pay raise. For us to invest as a state like that, 
I think sends a clear message that we believe in our teachers. We back our teachers and we want to help support you and show you the respect that we think you deserve for being willing to step into the classroom every single day. But we also have high expectations because we know you're capable of it. If we didn't, then we would just walk away and say, you know what, there's nothing we can do here. But that's not the case. If you look at the way that we are spending our time, if you look at what we are talking about, what we were investing in, you will see that it is an education. Because one, we know it can make a difference. And we know that that is impossible if we don't have good teachers in the classroom. That just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen by mistake. It happens because we have teachers who are willing to step up. So that's my message is we believe in you. We know you're capable of it. We're going to continue to set the bar high because we know you'll live up to it. Because I've met the teachers across this state and we have some of, like I said, the very best that you will find anywhere in the country. And we know that our students deserve exactly that. So we want to keep those people in the classroom so that our kids have the ability to be anything that they want to be. And that's going to start in classrooms across Arkansas. So thank you for your service to your classroom, to your students, and certainly to our state. And I hope that you will help us share that message that we have total confidence in the teachers of Arkansas to deliver for our students. I would like to echo the sentiments. Thank you for uh, inspiring young scholars that you stand in front of each and every single day. And I, I think my message to teachers is, is along the lines, the, the same lines is um, we have to recruit, recognize, and retain the best. The research is very clear. The number one indicator of students' success is the teacher standing in front of them each and every single day. The number two indicator of success is the principal leading that school. So oftentimes we forget about the investment we're making in our school leaders because good teachers will follow a good principal anywhere. Good teachers will leave a bad principal every single day. So we, we've got to get good leaders to invest in good teachers. And, and if, I was, if I was in front of all teachers to, today, let's say if this is a room full of teachers, my conversation would be around, we're going to give you the resources to set you up to be successful. Because right now we're in a little bit fragmented system. Everybody's working hard, but if we're working on the wrong stuff or we don't have clear expectations of what we have, it's going to be really hard to get the outcomes that we need. So I like to say we're, if we're building an educational house, we're pouring a foundation, the slab that we're going to build everything on starts with good standards. And when I talk about educational standards, I'm talking about what do we define that we want each student to know and learn at each grade in each subject. Um, previously, uh, in, un, uh, until recently, our state board adopted New English Language Arts and Math Standards. If you looked at the new standards versus the old standards, the old standards were very confusing and nobody knew what they meant. So we got you clear and concise language so that you know what we're expecting for students to know and learn in each and every single classroom. That's step one. That's a big deal to teachers when they can say, okay, this is what I'm expected to know because if I confusing or unclear standards before, everybody's guessing on what they need to do. We need to be strategic and laser-like on our focus of what's happening in our classrooms. So we're giving you good standards. The first wall that we're going to build to hold up the, the house is high quality instructional materials aligned with those standards. So you have the resources, the primary instructional tool to deliver the lessons that you design to meet the needs of your students. The second wall is the professional development to give you the best training that you can have for strategies to meet the needs of your students. And then the roof that holds it all together is how do we assess and monitor student performance. So we're going to have a statewide uh, coordinated monitoring progress system in K1, 2, and 3. We're moving away from um, a college and career readiness standardized assessment to a criterion-based assessment so that you'll get data back that says your kids are learning what we expect them to learn and just making all the confusion that's happening in our schools, make it all go away so that we can be laser-like focused on the evidence that we know it's works and uh, give you the support that you need to make that happen. You know, if I could just, I, I wanna jump in on something that you brought to my attention a couple months ago that I think is a, a really useful tool. We have a lot of data, but it wasn't streamlined and it wasn't usable. And one of the things that we found out is there was a teacher uh, not too far from where we are right now that year after year continued to perform at the highest level, had a really tough demographic makeup in the classroom, and um, yet her students continued to grow and achieve year after year, yet no one ever told her. 
We didn't even pay attention to the fact it was happening. And so move up every single year because that is something we simply have just not paid attention to and not used the information at our disposal. And I think that's another way that we can help our teachers by saying, look, you have some of the most difficult makeup that you're going to find anywhere in the state, and yet your students continue to achieve. Thank you for what you're doing. Reward that individual, but also how can we help you teach other teachers that may have a similar makeup in their classroom and use that as a, a, as a resource instead of just ignoring those simple data points. So I, I like to talk about these high impact teachers, and I think that's part of it is, is letting people know that are doing a good job. Like, hey, by the way, you're doing a good job because we were able to collect this data, but we didn't have a platform to share it, which we've now been able to roll out since January. But I always like to look for high impact teachers at persistently failing schools, right? Are there people out there that are bucking the system? In order to be a high impact teacher, that means you're getting more than one standard deviation above the norm. Basically, you're getting more than a year's worth of growth out of your students. How are you doing that? So I like to look at DNS school. There's hundreds of teachers in the state that teach in DNS schools that get more than a year's worth of growth out of their students and they don't even know it. We don't even tell their principals, we don't tell their superintendents. We have now, in fact, we, we're inviting them all to a professional learning opportunity this summer because we got to find out what they're, work, what they're doing because it works and make sure they can share it with the classrooms next door to them. Thank you. We've got a question here from my friend Nikki. First, I want to say thank you to you two for everything you have done for education in Arkansas. And my question is, school's, you know, going to start in, not, in just a few months. And I know the Learns Act is facing some legal trouble. So what does that look like moving forward? And what should we expect for the next school year? You know, you see, we have this game where we decide who takes which questions. <laughs> so far, I've gone first on all of them. So yeah, if anybody has something really I'm, difficult. I'm the one that has to testify in court. Though, Secretary so. Oliva. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> I've done my time. Okay. So um, on this, obviously, uh, some challenges. I, at, at the end of the day, I, let me make this really simple. Learns is going to go into effect. We are simply delaying the inevitable. At this point, uh, we have ongoing litigation. Um, I feel very confident that at the end of the day, the court is going to rule in our favor. And so we're moving full steam ahead and preparing uh, for the fall as if it will. And as soon as um, we can, we're going to continue to make sure that our school safety trainings that are currently on hold, our teacher pay raises that are currently on hold, our uh, maternity leave that is currently on hold, all of the new changes, the positive things that we are going to see through LEARNS, our uh, ability to hire reading coaches at the state level, all those things are currently on hold because I believe people are trying to play political games with our kids' future. At the end of the day, we're not gonna let that happen. This is too important. The future of our state literally, I think, hangs in the balance of our kids being able to have access to a good quality education. This helps do that, and we're not gonna stop until we see it implemented. So, Governor and Dr. Oliva, thank you for the innovation in education because we know Arkansas is innovating in a lot of our ways in our businesses and so on. I would like to have the Asylum Springs School Superintendent ask our next question. I was hoping you wouldn't identify me. <laughs> <laughs> you can run, but you can't hide. So, so I'm going to reference back to what Dr. Oliva talked about, the, the House of Education foundation of quality standards, the one wall of resources uh, that, are, that are the same across the state, and the wall of professional development, and the overlapping umbrella or the roof of accountability. So I agree with all of those things, and, and I, think, I think we're making strides with standards. I think we're changing our testing system is fantastic for us, I think. Um, my question is, if that is the foundation, the two walls, and the roof, of education in Arkansas, how is it that we are veering with educational freedom accounts to provide taxpayer money to private schools and homeschool parents that do not have any of those constraints? 
They don't have that foundation of the same standards. They do not have the two walls, and they do not have the same system of accountability. Um, I'm not against providing that, that money to those folks and those, those institutions, but it seems like we're trying to level the playing field for the students on one side, but not necessarily leveling the playing field for the institutions on the other side. So, so first, I, I go back to a statement that Governor Sanders said that the LEARNS bill is about supporting the neighborhood public schools. First and foremost, most parents are gonna choose the school that's in their neighborhood. There's value in children that grow up in the same zip code, that go to school together and play t ball together. Oftentimes you get multiple generations of families across multiple spectrums. But not the, the local school district may not be the best choice for every single family. So what we're trying to do is make sure that parents have options available to them. If I was to push back a little bit, it would be that there is going to be accountability for the private school programs. It may not be the same. I don't know that that's what you're gonna say. It may not be there yet. It may get there one day, but there's gonna be accountability. We're not gonna create a choice system just to have choice. It's not about just creating options that may be worse options for families. We wanna have quality choice programs for students and families. So there will be accountability measures in place. Those participating private schools, if they choose to participate, would have to offer a approved standardized assessment. If the family chooses to participate, then they know that that's what they're choosing to participate to sign up for. And I know we can have this philosophical debate that it should be apples, apples, oranges, oranges. Right now, it's a really small program, and it has a small percentage of families that are participating. And in fact, in year one, is targeting uh, uh, opportunities for families in failing schools where the local school system has been failing year after year after year, and these parents want to exercise another option. Sometimes these parents are so desperate, they don't care what the other option is. They just know what's working, and that local school district is failing their children. So we want to build that local school district so that it's not failing by building that educational house, but then also meeting those family needs. As this program grows, as we have future conversations, maybe changing the accountability system or set of standards may be a part of that. But sometimes families that are choosing some of that private option, we have parents that are choosing those options now, may be looking for something different than they get from their local neighborhood school so that we wanna make sure those private schools have uh, the autonomy to operate the frameworks that they were set up for as well. Right. I couldn't agree more. I think it is important to echo that there is that accountability measure that is still in there. It's not like, oh, best of luck, here's state money and see what you do with it. There will be a standard. The schools have to opt in if they want to participate in the program. The other thing that I think is important to remind people is the funding that comes and follows a student is not the only funding that public schools and districts receive. There is a significantly more uh, financial funding that goes to our public schools than the private schools will receive through educational freedom accounts, whether it's through facilities funding, there's also more foundation funding that go directly to the public schools that those private schools don't have. So it's not that we are trying to, uh, you know, push the scale down uh, in favor of private school. Like I said, this is a massive investment in public education, one of the biggest that we've made in decades. And so we want our public schools to be successful because we know that's where the majority of our kids are going to ultimately be educated however if that doesn't fit the needs of a student we want there to be options so that whatever that looks like a parent has the ability for their child to get the education that their kid deserves because at the end of the day like I said earlier there's not a person in this room who wants a kid to be in a place where they're not having their needs met I truly believe that everybody here wants to see the needs of each student met. And that doesn't mean that a public school isn't doing a good job. They just may not have the ability to specialize in something that another student needs. I'm a mom, I have three kids. All three of my kids need different things. And so I wanna make sure that the place that they're in is a place where each of their needs are being met. And I think every parent should have that opportunity and that ability. I might call on uh, the University of Arkansas endowed chair of school choice, Dr. Patrick Wolf, has been a, a leading expert nationally uh, on school choice. And so if you have a question or a comment, we're thankful that you're here this morning. <laughs> thank, thank you, Representative Hawk. 
thank you, Governor Sanders and, and Secretary Oliva. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion of many aspects, many exciting aspects of the LEARNS Act. Um, but uh, the state of Arkansas was one of the early states uh, launching public charter schools. So can you talk a bit about uh, the, the uh, provisions of LEARNS that will be supporting charter schools as an option for parents? So I, I think it goes along the same line that um, we want to invest in local public neighborhood schools. If they can't meet the need of all students and families and maybe there's charter opportunities, private school opportunities, we haven't talked about virtual opportunities. A lot of families choose homeschool opportunities and what does that uh, look like for them? But when it, when it comes to charter schools and accountability, they are held to the same standard. Those students participate in the same standardized assessments. They receive a school grade, just like the neighborhood public school, because they are public schools. And basically, the charter is, is a charter. And every, every state's a little bit different on how they, they operate, but it's a charter with the state that they're going to open up into a, a community and serve a certain number of students and be measured and held to that same uh, county uh, accountability. I don't have much to add other than that on that one. If we could, I think, just to make sure, I know we want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, Tyler, if we can open it up a little bit, and anybody that has a question, raise your hand. I know we have time for a couple more questions, and that way, um, if there's anybody that we want to make sure we address, we'll be happy to do that. We'll jump over here and take these two and then go to the next spot. My question uh, pertains to once our kids can read and write and they are in high school, um, we have a labor shortage here in Arkansas. How is the Department of Education working in concert with workforce development to, to send kids into careers to feed the pipeline for our state, for business and industry, and for future entrepreneurs? A great question, and I, I think this is one of the things um, that, frankly, the entire country has failed on. This is not a problem that is unique to Arkansas, but uh, one of the things I noticed certainly traveling around on the campaign, every single community I went into, every business leader I met with, it didn't matter what part of the state they were in, what kind of industry they operated in, the number one thing that they said their biggest challenge was hiring a skilled, qualified workforce. So our ability to meet that need is critical for long-term success for the state of Arkansas. One of the things that we've done through the LEARNS legislation is create a dual diploma track, allowing students at a much earlier uh, age and a much earlier point in their high school and junior high career is to start getting certification, start getting exposure to some of those critical high demand fields that exist right here in the state of Arkansas. One of the very first things that I did as governor was signed an executive order creating a workforce cabinet. One of the things we found out very quickly is asking, we have seven different agencies that have a workforce component or a workforce office. I asked how often they were meeting. How often are you all getting together? And they said, well, we've never met. I said, I'm sorry, I don't understand. You're all tasked with working in the exact same space and you've never sat down together. And they're like, well, I kind of work in, on my issue here and I do this here. But they had never sat at the same table and figured out where we are, where are we going, what do we need um, and, and addressing those kind of critical points. And so we created what we call the workforce cabinet and are requiring that group of people and our agency heads to sit down at the same table and work on a develop a plan that helps us execute at the highest level when it comes to meeting the workforce shortage. I also hired somebody I call the chief workforce officer, pulled straight from the private sector who spent the last 20 to 30 years training people around the state in the private sector to build up their workforce. And that person reports directly to our office and works with that workforce cabinet. So we now have a actual coordinated approach, which is new for state government to coordinate and work together, but we're giving it a whirl, and bringing all of our resources to the table. One of the other things is that this is not a government problem. 
It cannot be a simply government solution. We have to bring in the business community. We have to bring in the education community. And that's what we're trying to do through LEARNS, is by having all the stakeholders at the table. If you're an educator, if you're a business leader, if you're a community leader, all those players at the same table helping us address this workforce shortage is how we're going to get there. We also have to change the mindset of a lot of people around the state and around the country. We told people for so long that if you didn't go to college, you were somehow less than, when nothing could be further from the truth. We have such a huge demand for students to go directly into the workforce. I strongly believe that we focused far too long on only what does a student know, not what can a student do. And we have to start looking at this from a standpoint of what is this student capable of when they finish? Is this a student that should go straight into the workforce and have we given the tool, them the tools that they need to do that? Or do they need to go into a vocational or a trade program, a two-year school, or a four-year university? Those aren't bad things. We're not saying that all of a sudden all the four-year universities are, are negative, but there needs to be a pathway for every student, and they don't all look the same. And that's why creating flexibility with our schools, but also a partnership from the state level is so critical, and that's one of the biggest and I think most important pieces of this legislation is a huge focus on doing exactly what you said is answering that workforce shortage. Yeah, and, and one of the terms, uh, yeah. <laughs> One of the terms that Governor Sanders used was about pathways, and not every student is on a highway to university. Now, I'm not saying they can't eventually get there, but there needs to be multiple exit and on-ramps as people go through educational opportunities and attainment. And one of the things that I'm actually really, really excited about that's in the LEARNS uh, bill is that it tasks our agency with creating a career high school diploma which is a little bit new to the state. And I don't think there's a lot of other states that have something that recognizes that. Because we have, uh, even up in this region, definitely some really robust uh, programs for students to earn credentials of value or industry certifications. They become program completers. So how do we give recognition for those students while they're earning that in high school? But then also, how do they take what they've earned in high school and be able to apply it to a post-secondary institution if they choose to articulate and go on? Right now, it's not a seamless system. So you could have a student in high school earn um, a CNA or, or an LPN or an, you know, one, a nursing certificate while they're in, in high school. And depending on the receiving institution, if they want to go further on that program, some institutions will say, well, you didn't take it and learn it here, so you have to start all over. Well, that's not fair. That, that needs to stop. We can have robust systems in, in high school that articulate to robust opportunities, and that's something we're excited to work about. We're so thankful you have Mike Rogers on your team from fellow asylumers. Yeah. Uh, we're thankful for that on the career readiness team. We, we refer to Mike as the disruptor yes. in uh, yes. state government. So uh, I don't think all of government was quite ready for the, the speed and the pace <laughs> and the uh, enthusiasm that Mike brings to the He's table. He's got good so. roots from this, this neck of the woods. Yeah. We've got a question for, um, from my friend Carrie here. Hi, my name is Carrie Eben, and um, I'm a, a founder of a Sager Classical School here in Salem uh, Springs, Arkansas. Um, I also just kind of represent probably the smaller portion of the population affected by the LEARNS Act with uh, private schools and even homeschool. So I was just wondering, um, how can you encourage you know, somebody who is advising homeschoolers and um, people at our school, um, how can you encourage um, us as far as you know, taking advantage of the LEARNS Act? Um, who is on, you know, who, who is making decisions on behalf of homeschoolers in the state as well as people who are um, in the private education sector? So, you know, there are other things that um, we consider as far as like, uh, you know, assessment since we are being, you know, expected if we opt in. There are certain uh, standards of assessment. Um, are there other options for assessment that are being considered? Um, I know there's the classical learning test, which is something that we use, and just also encouraging, um, you know, how how can a small school like us uh, 
benefit really from the LEARNS Act is we're trying to match our education costs with the tuition that we actually ask for. So I, I guess I'm just asking some of those, that, that was a lot of questions there. But uh, just on behalf of, of that part of the LEARNS Act, I just would love to hear you speak to that. Sure, I, I think I'm gonna try to unpack as much of that as I can. Um, I, I think one of the places, if I'm reading your question correctly that you're looking for is kind of having a seat at the table. Um, one of the things that is ongoing, well it was ongoing, I guess we're kind of at a, at a st standstill right now as uh, we wait on court ruling and move through that process, but is the rulemaking that is taking place right now. And um, we have several different groups that are helping on the rulemaking side. Um, and I know that there are uh, individuals who are representing those different communities. I think we took in probably close to 12 to 1300 applications for people who wanted to be part of the rulemaking process and tried to make sure that was reflective of communities across the state. And so there are uh, homeschool, private school, public school, charter school representatives on all of those rulemaking communities. And so I would encourage you maybe to reach out to some of the other uh, entities that are similar to yours and see who might be part of that rulemaking process uh, because those people will be a great advocate and voice not only to relay concerns but also to bring information back uh, about specifics in the legislation that would benefit. Um, I think that's probably one of the best pathways, but Secretary Oliva can probably go into a little bit more sure. detail on so, that. Yes, a great question. So once the bill got signed into law, that, that's when we go into how are we gonna implement the law. So we have the state board rulemaking process and we made a commitment to all the legislatures and everybody in the state that we we're gonna do that in a clear and transparent manner. And when we put out that statewide call, we, we put it out statewide. Anybody that wants to volunteer to be on a work group, sign up here. So we were diligent in our approach to make sure that there is representation from all regions of the state and all different associations in establishing the work groups. While some of the work has been paused temporarily, uh, pr previous to the injunction, they were meeting to start developing draft language. So even when the work group gets together with the draft language, it'll still go out for public review uh, through the rules making process. So if there's stuff that's in the draft language, we're always welcome and receptive to feedback because we got to get it right. We're gonna we're gonna move from the bottom in the nation to the top, and it starts with quality implementation and implementation with fidelity which is why we had to get the rules right. So we established a portal that I'd encourage you to check on. Um, I wanna say it's learns.ade at arkansas.gov, but I get sometimes the ats and the dots in the wrong place, but there, there's a portal that's established that has who all the work group members are, when they're meeting, what's their progress, and um, when we get rolling again, we'll be updating that. I think we've got time for maybe one or two more questions, and I promised this lady over here that I would come to her, and then uh, Delia will come to you after that with the question you have. See, I didn't forget. I promised we would come back. Now, this will probably be the question that ruins my career, but maybe not. <laughs> and then I'll say, I'm so sorry. We actually did not have time for your question. But. <laughs> no. Um, I've been in the classroom for 27 years. Um, we have many wonderful kids, wonderful parents. As you know, the education of a child is really like a three-legged stool. It involves the teacher, of course, the child, and the parents. Um, since COVID, absenteeism has been a real problem. Um, apathy has also I, at least from my perspective, I have seen apathy become a real problem. What can we do, what can you do from the state level to help all of our parents know how vital it is for their kids to be at school and how vital it is for the kids and the parents to know how important this education is? We can't do it alone. I, I think we're up against a... a very big uphill climb. Uh, first, thank you for 27 years in the classroom. You look phenomenal for having been in the classroom for 27 years. 
In government, we joke that we age in dog years, about seven at a time. In the classroom, I think it's probably a little bit more than that, given the amount of stress that you're under. Uh, so good for you on that. I think ultimately there's not a silver bullet to this. There's not a perfect answer. But I think the fact that we are spending so much time talking about education, I'm trying to make this uh, the hallmark of everything that we are doing in state government and bringing it back to that, using the platform and the microphone I have to talk about the importance of it. We're trying to do that in every capacity possible. And I think that's one step, but that's gonna take the entire community. It's gonna take people uh, that are not educators. It's gonna take people that are not in government echoing those same things and trying to uh, bring awareness to the fact of the problem that you're facing in the classroom. I think one of the other things that we have to do is stop watering it down. We are continuing, instead of raising the bar, we keep dropping the bar. And we should be doing the opposite. We shouldn't just say, you know what, we think our students are only gonna do this, so let's put the bar here. We know that they're capable of being up here, so let's raise the bar and ask them to meet it. We've got to stop expecting and focusing on the lowest common denominator and start raising the bar and raising expectations of both our students and our parents because we know that they can get there. And if we water it down, we're gonna get watered down numbers and results. But if we raise the bar, our people are exceptional and they are gonna rise to that challenge. And that's what we're trying to do by raising the standards, making them clear, bringing a system together that is coordinated and focused on the results. And I think if we keep beating that drum, we're gonna get there. It's not gonna happen overnight. And we're not gonna have a perfect system, but we can do a lot better than we are. And that's what I think that this piece of legislation is gonna deliver. Wonderful. We have one more question right here to close us out in the back. In the back. This is my friend Marla in the back here. I'm glad I just Hello. Um, I have a, a question I've been trying to weave into one because it might be three questions, but they all go together. <laughs> so I'll try real fast. Um, <clears throat> I've taught for 22 years in Arkansas schools and I'm super proud to be in the Salem Springs School District as well. I have a couple of questions. One um, that was addressed was school choice and just the standards which you spoke of but said it could be years off or whatever of getting them together or on the same page. Um, I have students who have enrolled from homeschooling or other schools late in the year in second grade that don't even know the letters in their name. They don't have an IEP. They don't have a language um, barrier. And so trying to get those students up to where they need to be <clears throat> is very hard. I had the same thing happened. Um, someone enrolled the very end of um, kindergarten year and didn't even know the first letter of the said student's name, which was X, which like every kid knows the letter X, but um, he did not. And so <clears throat> just looking at that, that, that concerns me with, um, is there funding for interventionists for schools at the lower level now and how many and um, in 1999 I believe it was there was CRS classroom reduction size and I just remember sitting after we had that we sat in a meeting and um, it was a couple of years later they were putting up reports and they said what were we doing what are you doing our scores were so good here why have they dropped what's happened and I looked up being the young teacher I was and I was like well, wait, that's the year that we had the classroom reduction size. We only had that for one year, and then it went down. And so what is the cap on classrooms as well? Because that would help a teacher to intervene too. Sure. So thank you uh, for being here and for being a classroom teacher. So the standards have been adopted. They're going to be fully implemented for this upcoming school year for ELA and math. So we're going through to, a, to align to high-quality materials. Our agency is doing training now all through the summer and working with district leaders to make sure that they're able to give the support to the teachers like you for implementation. Alignment to the new assessment, in fact, there's teams working now because we, we wanted to make sure that when we rewrote the standards, they were representative of Arkansas educators that knew Arkansas students for Arkansas classrooms. So we had work groups that represented the entire state working on that. Well, at the same time with updating what we want students to know and learn, and getting a new assessment, we wanted 
Arkansas educators to work on the test writing specifications, the test writing items, the items that are going to be assessed to be aligned. And they're working now. So that assessment is going to hit our classrooms in the spring of 24. We're, this was the last year of ACT Aspire. We're moving to a new assessment. That new assessment is still being written, but it'll be done and ready in time. And uh, educators will be trained on what that blueprint and uh, test item specifications are for them. So when we talk about acting with urgency, um, we are acting with urgency because these systems that have been misaligned have to be aligned so that you can be successful in your classroom. So, well, home, homeschool is a separate program. So homeschool is a, a program that parents are using on their own. If, if, a, if a parent chooses to participate in a freedom account, that freedom account's not gonna be available to the 24-25 school year. So the Learns Bill doesn't address the homeschooling educational system at all. So parents and students are gonna move. I have a son that's moving to high school uh, from this state from another state. Those teachers might say he's behind, might say he's above. People are gonna move and enroll in schools. I think the question more is, if we have a student that comes in with significant gaps, what are the resources available so that we can get them the intervention they need to get them back to a grade level opportunity? So part of what we're doing with LEARNS is um, investing in literacy coaches statewide to work with school districts and leaders to train teachers on the strategies that'll work for, for those students, as well as providing um, scholarship opportunities for parents to get high impact tutoring. There's a high impact tutoring program because that's oftentimes what those students need. And a lot of school districts have high quality, high impact tutoring programs that they've initiated to address COVID learning loss. So how do we get some of these dollars to sustain that? So if a family moves in and there's significant gaps in that child, that there's a system, a robust system to get them in, to get them caught up and in place. And, and just to, to clarify one point, I, I think there may be a little confusion. If when it opens up the educational freedom accounts that would allow uh, a parent to take advantage of that that chooses to homeschool, they would be required to do that standardized assessment. Um, if they opt into the program, if they don't, then that is independent of what uh, we are doing through the LEARNS legislation. But if they opt in, they would be required to have that state standardized assessment. So there'll be accountability. So there is accountability if they're receiving state dollars. And, and I think another piece that is important, it's not like the state, if somebody says, oh, sure, I'll opt in, send me a check. That's not how it works. Uh, it works through a third party vendor and system so that um, dollars can be used to purchase curriculum or uh, textbooks. It's not so they can go out and buy an Xbox and to get, they get a blank check from the state. That is simply not happening. It has to be specific to educational needs like textbooks and curriculum, um, not anything that that person would deem and try to classify as an educational material. Well, let's give it a hand for Governor and Secretary. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Thank you. I know we didn't get a chance to answer all questions. Please, we've got some of those submitted. We will get back to you on those. But we thank you so much for taking time. They are literally going across the state hosting these uh, intentionally, right? We, you, you can have folks that just say, this is what we're doing. Shut up and get out of the way. That's not what this, this is about. I appreciate this administration for doing this the right way to make sure we get everybody on board and get questions answered so we can all row in the same direction. So thank you all again for coming. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Thank you.